They survived while the dinosaurs vanished. They are feared even today. A family of adaptable killers who hunt by stealth and surprise. They are the oldest reptiles on Earth, the crocodiles, caimans, and kin, dating back to the dawn of the dragons. The cool air of the upper Nile where the river reflects a world that's unfamiliar. And the morning mist evokes the dawn of life. As the light absorbs darkness, life feeds on death. And this is a killer, the Nile crocodile. Across Africa, it lurks where the water and the land converge. The reptile's history stretches back 200 million years, when its ancestors lived only on the land. But as animals like the hippo were to discover, adapting to water had definite advantages. For members of the crocodilian group, the crocodiles, caimans, and alligators, water provided a well-stocked source of food. The crocs who could stay down the longest proved more successful hunters. One breath can sustain an 18-foot crocodile for up to an hour. Hippos, who are vegetarians, feed on land at night but during the day, they need the water to protect their skin from an unrelenting sun. The African darter also divides its time between the world of air and the liquid world below. But not all species have the benefit of an alternative. In the savannas of East Africa, when the dry season hits and the grass shrivels up, thousands of grazers like wildebeests and zebras are forced to move to greener pastures. This seasonal migration of the grassland herds cuts through various sections of the Nile crocodile's extensive habitat. The long and arduous trek provides a hungry predator with an opportunity of high returns. But the zebras have advantages. A herd offers safety in numbers, for only a few get killed, and they are usually young animals, since predators prefer easy prey. Their strategy also targets animals weakened by old age or injury. A showdown is about to begin. The head zebra hesitates. 
But it has a strategy, too. It charges ahead, plowing, kicking, bucking, leaving the crocs to founder in the wake. The predators need to collaborate to pull a zebra down. Even then, it isn't easy. With prey this large, the only tactic they can use is death by drowning. Crocodile heads for the far end, where the herd encounters a slippery bottom. could not manage to drown the zebra by itself. For the hunter, no food, though its energy was drained. But all predators fail, most of the time. A crocodile does not recover from exertion quickly which means it cannot afford too many losses. Other members of this community have learned a crocodile's habits. It spends the night in the water because of the chilly air. Then, after the sun is up, the croc swims back to shore to heat its cold reptilian blood with solar energy while others go about their business. All the crocodilians, including caimans and the alligators, are expert at conserving energy. The Nile crocodile probably has no more than 50 meals a year. That's all, because the less fuel it uses, the less often it needs to eat. Excellent efficiency. But the crocodile must absorb sufficient heat or digestion won't occur. Hunks of flesh are swallowed whole, then broken down by stomach acids. This is vital because a croc can neither tear nor chew its food, its teeth, are used for gripping. But to get the acids going requires sufficient heat. Depending on external sources for temperature control may seem like a handicap, but the crocodile family has been around about 195 million years longer than we have.
all the crocodiles open wide to gape as the heat begins to peak, a way of cooling off the old theory assumed. But that explanation was dismissed when crocodiles were found to gape even where the temperatures remained constant. Like much of animal behavior, gaping remains a mystery. A croc that goes back to the water in the middle of the day is fully charged, so it must not be ignored. Just in case, it's hungry. The crocodilians are hunters who prefer to sit and wait for a victim to come their way. But a well-developed sense of smell and a keen ear pick up early cues for a sneak attack. Dragged back into deeper water, the zebra faces double jeopardy. Not only must it fight the pull of powerful teeth, but now its vulnerable nose is within easier reach. more exposed in the shallows, a crocodile can be dismissed as a rock. Cooperative effort is rewarded with equal shares, and there is little evidence of competition or dispute. What cannot be immediately ripped off may be left for the river and time to soften. But the crocodile excels in waiting.
In northern Kenya, around Lake Turkana, crocodiles lay their eggs after the rainy season's over, the end of December. But sometimes, the rain suddenly returns. While all the other reptiles lay their eggs and leave, members of the crocodilian family spend months guarding theirs, helping them to hatch, and briefly, even caring for the young. But they cannot stop the rain. The unwelcomed rain has washed away the bank and exposed her eggs to peril. But a mother can only wait. She waits to see if some survive. Most of the eggs haven't got a chance but as long as some survive. The trials of life are immediate and completely without sentiment. Females in the area respond. The mothers have invested three months of vigilance, which may have required fasting as well. Now the cries alert them to help the newborn hatch. With the very teeth designed to pull down prey, the mother lifts a baby to the safety of her jaws. And the safety of the water. Sometimes, as many as 90 eggs are laid, but only a fraction are likely to survive. A matter of probability. But if all of the eggs always hatched and matured, there would be far too many crocodiles for a habitat to support. Natural selection takes its toll. In nature, nothing is ever squandered, and no amount of energy ever disappears. 
energy just keeps passing on from eggs to crocodiles to ants and so to infinity. The opportunists come in a variety of sizes, and they're very much a part of nature's efficiency, which ensures that nothing is ever wasted. The mother doesn't interfere. She's there to assist the hardy ones, those who can reach the water's edge alive. Though it may appear otherwise, nature is neither kind nor cruel. It's merely indifferent to who survives or dies. Some are luckier than others. And there are some who seem to have an intuitive edge. As long as some survive. The odds seem stacked against the reptile, the advantage on the side of the hungry ibis. But if that were the case, Crocodiles would have vanished long ago. For a species to survive, there must always be the next generation and predators to help maintain a balanced community. Life does depend on death. But life also depends on continuity and genes to be passed on to the future, to be tested by an ever-changing world. croc is born with a yolk sac in its stomach. For the first few weeks of life, the yolk is the only food it needs. When the supply runs out, basic instincts then take over. Veils of clouds obscure the world below. Treacherous cliffs 
keep that world at bay. While forms of life found nowhere else on Earth thrive high above the plains of Venezuela. Islands of rock, thousands of feet above the highlands, send water plunging to the land below. These vast plains, the Llanos, were once the floor of an ancient sea. Now a thick layer of clay seals the surface. During the rainy season, this causes the Llanos to flood. Covered by water much of the year, the land resists human interference. Therefore, nature is largely left alone, yielding a variety of mini habitats, like groves of palms among the soggy marshes. Altogether, the Llanos produce a significant diversity of species. The effect of continental drift on evolution is well illustrated by the common caiman. Native to Central and South America, these smaller crocodilians evolved only after Africa and South America had drifted apart. The world's largest rodent lives exclusively within the common caiman's range. Over two feet tall, the capybara benefits by letting tyrant flycatchers eat the parasites that suck its blood. Unfortunately for the capybara, the birds cannot protect it from a hungry caiman. But this predator most often eats fish. The water that covers the Llanos contains ample fish including a variety of eels. The abundance provides easily available food for the caiman and for many others. But an easy catch does not always guarantee a quick meal. The whistling heron could burn more calories trying to kill the eel than it might gain once the fish is digested. Eels present a somewhat different problem for the caiman. Unlike the heron, it can quickly overcome the eel's resistance with its teeth. But like all the reptiles, a caiman cannot really chew, so the entire eel must be swallowed. Sensing that it's safe, an iguana edges towards the pond. Across the Anos, a never-ending challenge is to find escape from the heavy heat. Water certainly provides relief, but only at great risk.
Though howler monkeys often issue an alarm, for the iguana, their warnings come too late. At last, the onslaught of the sun backs down as night invades the sky. But in the dimming light, the predator is still at work. Filling its entire body cavity, the caiman has swallowed all it can. More of its victim will not fit until stomach acids have done their job. What light remains guides the weary to a place they might be safe from those who hunt at night. For caimans, it's the water, where their sensitive jaws may detect the vibrations of approaching predators. The jaguar is a swimmer, and it hunts at night. Across the pond, a hundred caiman eyes glow with the light of the moon. And now the creatures of the night will have their turn, as darkness casts the illusion of tranquility across the caiman's world. During the season of the rains, from May on through October, the bounty of vegetation extends throughout the flooded plains of Venezuela. At this time, many animals disperse to a variety of habitats scattered across the Anos. Species that are highly mobile, such as the macaws, can cover a wide area in search of fruiting trees. Others, like the spider monkey, use vines and limbs to get around. The kingfisher needs a perch. But the animals living in the Llanos, whether they're arboreal or not, must eventually come to the water. And the water is the Cayman's domain. Caution is a key to survival. It's the caiman, just trying to flush a fish. But the anteater has learned to be cautious. Species living in the same community must learn to understand each other's ways. A monkey would need just one encounter to realize that electric eels are territorial. Had the eel killed the intruder, a new monkey might have moved in and made the same mistake, and the newcomer would have to be killed. So it's easier to teach the first one to stay clear. But new neighbors, especially young ones, do turn up.
nearly electrocuted, but not quite, by a signal of no trespassing, delivered via 700 volts and repeated several times. Even where there's little elbow room, territorial disputes between two species are rarely fatal. Except when trespass meets with hunger. The stranglehold of the anaconda's rippling muscles can be just as deadly as another snake's venom. A victim less than eight feet long is crushed by 15 feet of constricting power. Fortunately for the smaller reptile, anacondas do not hunt for caimans. But hunger always welcomes an easy opportunity. Under crowded conditions, boundaries break down. When prey is plentiful, keeping out the competition is simply wasting energy. Competing for resources can include basking spots. The best, not necessarily going to the oldest, but to the biggest. And sometimes to the most numerous. For the last 20 years, since a hunting moratorium was declared, the Cayman has been gaining in numbers and moving into habitats once dominated by the largest reptile in South America, the Orinoco crocodile. The common caiman, rarely longer than eight feet, is normally hunted by its enormous cousin who can reach 25 feet plus. But today, there's only a shrinking population of Orinocos in a tiny pocket of the Anos. Everywhere else, the seemingly indestructible hunter has been hunted to extinction or its valuable hide. Traditional roles of predator and prey have again been played. But in fact, the relationship is very different than it used to be. While both species were nearly wiped out some 20 years ago, the Cayman made a strong comeback and took over areas that were once ruled by the Orinoco. Despite its greater size, the crocodile is losing to its prey. 
It may look like it's ahead of the game, but more often, mature caiman devour the Orinoco's young. Because the smallest Orinocos can easily be killed by grown caimans, the Orinoco population remains critically low. The pressures of survival increase drastically as the dry season advances. Much of the flooded plain has dehydrated, shriveled up, cracked open. little water remains seems to boil in the heat. But these are fish, armored catfish, gasping for oxygen that mud has displaced. It may prolong their life a bit, but it cannot save them. For the bird community, it's quite a different story. An opportunity to gorge with a minimum of effort. Many species will suffer heavy losses, but for the Orinoco, each dry season poses a greater threat. The ponds that are evaporating will fill up again with rainwater and with catfish. But a few more droughts could deliver one last blow to the Orinoco crocodiles. With the fate of the dinosaurs looming over it, the Orinoco hangs on. It can look like an inferno, started perhaps by lightning. But this is not destruction. This is the beginning of renewal. As pods and seed heads burst open and the land receives a new dose of nutrients. But rebirth will have to wait for the rains, which could be months away. Again, the common caiman has advantage on its side. Its lighter body makes it possible to travel several miles despite the searing heat in its search for water. The mobility available to vultures helps protect them from the ravages of drought and rewards them with access to more food. Cayman, on the other hand, may have to trudge across the wasteland to find water's relief. This is the fate of those whose homes evaporate.
the high walk keeps the caiman's belly off the burning ground. Its tail contains the bulk of fat and muscle on which it now depends. Survival for a hunter has many perils, many disadvantages. Though it can seem otherwise, it is no easier to be the predator than it is to be the prey. Those who have died from disease and malnutrition will soon be replaced by new life. And that life will be nurtured by the interplay of many things, things that are linked in ways yet unknown. But we do know that the rain must fall on fertile soil. and it must fall on the seeds that the land can sustain. It must unleash the energy from life that has withered. And pass it on to the life that remains. For a predator to prevail, it must be able to adjust to the changes that come its way. And this adjustment to change is not a matter of weakness or strength. It's simply a matter of survival.